No, Africa is there. May I have a the glass, please? Yes, please.
afternoon, everybody. Uh, and by the powers invested in me, you can take your seats. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this inaugural uh, lecture, which will be presented by Professor Puma Gobodo Madikizela. I'm Anthony Laysons, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and it gives me great, great pleasure to be able to introduce Prof. Pumla to all of you uh, today. So, uh, Professor, I'm going to take a little tour, and uh, I promise myself I'm not going to reveal anything that uh, is too, too far back. So, uh, you will all know that uh, uh, Professor Gobordo Marikizela is a holder of the research chair for historical trauma and transformation in our faculty. And she's also the South African National Research Chair in Violent Histories and Transgenerational Trauma. And she's the director of a brand new center in our faculty, the Center for the Study of the Afterlife of Violence and the Reparative Quest. So, uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, Prof. Pumla is a local, I could say. She was born in Langa, one of the oldest Cape Town residential areas, or as they were called and are still called, the townships, which were demarcated for black South Africans under apartheid. But she moved to Durban, where she attended the Inanda Seminary, a boarding high school for girls. And I think it was one of um, a few uh, private schools in South Africa which could be attended by black South Africans. Already at school, I think, has happened uh, with many people of that time. She was influenced and by uh, the black consciousness movement. She became an activist and was expelled from Inanda High School because of her political activities. From there on, she moved to Shawbury High School in Kumbu in the Eastern Cape. Now, as far as I can recall, that was also where Winnie Madikizela Mandela went. It was here that her diverse interests, and I'm talking about the arts now, uh, emerged. Because Prof. Pumla's one of her latest collaborative research projects in the center that I've just referred to also includes the arts. And what did she do? In that time, she produced uh, and directed and acted in a play, A Man for All Seasons, with an entire women cast. That uh, takes some doing. It's not well known, but uh, I think Prof. Pumla was nearly lost for the humanities because she excelled in mathematics and science when she was at school and in fact registered for a BSc, was then called a pre-med, at Rhodes, at Fort Hare University. But then there was an incident, I don't know what the incident was, what made her turn away from that path, but she did turn away from that path and ended up uh, graduating with a BA, uh, with a major in psychology from Fort Hare. Thereafter, she did an honors degree in psychology at the same university. And then, if there's one thing that's impressive about Pumla, it's how she's been around and about. She went on to Rhodes University, where she read for and received a master's in clinical psychology. At the beginning of the 90s, she finally returned to her place of birth in Cape Town, 
and registered for a PhD in psychology. And during that time, with all the changes happening in South Africa, I think she, she saw Table Mountain for the first time in a different light. She worked with Martin Leiting, an advocate involved in human rights work, and during her doctoral studies, her interest in the psychological aftermath of mass trauma increased. And it was while she was at Harvard, while doing her doctoral studies, at UCT, in about 1994-1995, time of great change, that she was invited to join the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa, where she served on the Human Rights Violations Committee until 1998. In 1998, she took up a fellowship at Harvard's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, sort of our equivalent of STIAS, where she remained for the next two years. During that time, she was also affiliated with the Harvard's Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Kennedy School and the Center of Ethics at Harvard's Divinity School. And in that time, her work came to focus also because of her experience at the TRC on something which is perhaps uniquely South African and which she came to engage with at the TRC. The forgiveness of the unforgivable. The work focused on what is needed for a process of reconciliation and what the concepts are, the central concepts which we must consider in the act of forgiveness. What is empathy? And what does it mean to be moved to offer forgiveness, but importantly also to ask for it and to offer an apology? This is what the impressive body of work she has built up through her talks, her publications, has revolved around and which continues to inspire. Another aspect of her work focuses on how the impact of dehumanizing experiences of oppression and violent abuse in the aftermath of historical trauma continues to play out in the next generation and the next generation and how it is passed on. This is the concept of intergenerational trauma. In 2003, she returned to South Africa, accepting an associate professorship at the University of Cape Town, where she went on to a full professorial appointment and also had to do an inaugural lecture. So thank you, Puma, for doing that twice. The title of her inaugural lecture was, and it also hints at the kind of work she was doing then, The Face of the Other. Human Dialogue at Psalms Delta and the Meaning of Moral Imagination. Now you will probably know that Psalms Delta is a, a, far, a wine farm in the Franschhoek district which embarked on a kind of experiment which in the end uh, didn't work out. She accepted a senior research professor in trauma, forgiveness and reconciliation at the University of the Free State in 2012. And in 2017, she was appointed as South African National Research Chair in Violent Histories and Transgenerational Trauma at Stellenbosch University. She's the author, the co-author and editor of numerous books, chapters in books, articles and conference papers. But the book that stands out for me is her 2003 publication, A Human Being Died That Night. A South African woman confronts the legacy of apartheid. 
And in that book, she recounts and reflects on her interviews with the apartheid state-sanctioned assassin, Eugene de Kock. This book won the Alan Payton Award for nonfiction in 2004, and also the United States' Christopher Award. Her honors include the Eleanor Roosevelt Medal, awarded in 2007, the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award by Education for Public Inquiry and International Citizenship in 2001, and that was at Tufts University. She's a holder of three honorary degrees, a Doctor of Law awarded by the Holy Cross College, an honorary doctorate awarded by the Friedrich Schiller Universität in Jena, Deutschland, an honorary doctorate from Rhodes University, which was awarded in 2019. And then she holds the Claude Arquet Visiting Chair, a collaboration between the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala University in Sweden and the Nordic Africa Institute. In 2022, and I was privileged and happy to be able to be at the opening event, which I later found out was on your birthday. Only, actually, I found it out today. Uh, under her leadership, the center which I referred to, the Interdisciplinary Center for the Study of the Afterlife of Violence and the Reparative Quest, or AFRIC, was established. And that center will be offering postgraduate masters and doctoral degrees in violent histories and repair. Professor Pumla Gobodo Marikizela, I now invite you to present your second inaugural lecture, but this time at the University of Stellenbosch. Thank you so much, uh, Tony, my, my dean. Um, I was, I just whispered in, in his ear, where did you get all that information? Because it wasn't in the bio that I sent. But thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. I, first, um, I would like to uh, um, acknowledge the presence of the rectorates, both in the room and online. So thank you very much. I can see those who are present in the room Really grateful that you could come. Thank you to my deans, uh, Professor Tony and Professor Reggie, um, and my boss, Professor Sibu. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for coming tonight, and uh, to my family at Avrec, and my blood family who are seated in front the nephews, nieces, sons. Uh, thank you very much to friends who are here. I noticed earlier that um, uh, Dr. Tarina Tron is also walked in as we were coming in. And I remember those first weeks when I came to Stellenbosch and you were such a strong source of support. You and um, my previous former boss, uh, Eugene Cloutier, so I'm so delighted you are here. Um, I want to start with a historical journey, very briefly. These lectures are so short that you have to squeeze everything in, so please forgive me if the squeezing uh, uh, is projected in the way I present. We, I hope we will have conversations afterwards. So grateful uh, to great Caesar, who is um, our coordinator of events at the center. We call him the great Caesar. He put together these uh, slides. So I want to start with a, 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 a just very brief journey of how I got this particular topic today, the afterlife 
of violent histories, a triadic temporality of memory, and the repair of humanism. It's a topic that has a long history that started with an investigation, as a Prof. Laysons was explaining, that was based on work that I did at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And now, 30 years after that period, there's been a revision. Uh, actually, over the past 10 years, there's been already a revision of the original scholarship into a different kind of angle that I'm taking with this work. So that was uh, the uh, inaugural that Prof. Laysons was referring to, and I won't go into detail about that. He just mentioned that. The work that uh, I've been engaged with is represented in texts through conferences, seminars, um, and these are some of the texts that are uh, co-edited and edited by myself, and they're based on conversations where I bring an interdisciplinary team to reflect on some of the topics that are interesting in this area. So those are some of the, of the texts, and most of them, most of the work that I've written is based on uh, conversations that uh, we curate with, um, uh, with colleagues, and some of whom are in the room here, uh, from South Africa to Rwanda to Switzerland to Italy. Some of these conversations are continuing uh, in Germany. One of the books there, the second from your right, is based on conversations on transgenerational trauma in Germany with co colleagues in Germany. So this is to say that the work really spans a wide uh, range in terms of time, but also in terms of the fields, the scholarly fields, uh, the disciplines, uh, rather. And so in the next two slides, I share with you just snippets of some of the conversations that we have organized um, at conferences. This one that you see over there is a, uh, was a conversation at UCT that we organized. We brought people across the globe, people from Rwanda, from Tanzania, from Zimbabwe, uh, all the conflict from Sudan, uh, from the Palestine, that next, actually the one before was uh, from the Palestinian conversations. We did, we, we, we curated what we called a round table conversations on trauma and healing. The idea was to bring scholars into conversation, these were part of conferences, to bring scholars into conversation with the people that they write about, that they research about. And so these conversations were very important for scholars in all of conferences when people wrote back uh, uh, reviews of the events. This kind of engagement was one that stood out for everyone. These were international conferences. We would have people coming from more than 20 countries in one instance. Uh, in fact, at this particular event, there were people from 31 countries coming to these conferences. And this was a time when South Africa was on the map. South Africa was a place of hope. Everyone was converging to these events to hear what the experiences of South Africa are. Because we're doing something new, something unique, something that always reminds me of the biblical text that says, behold, I do a new thing. And so this, for South Africans, was a very important moment historically. It continues to be important, but I think one of the things that is not happening in South Africa at the moment uh, is a reflection on the questions that I, I deal with today. Uh, earlier this year, the early work on this concept that I'm referring to as the triadic uh, concept of transgenerational memory. Early work on this topic has been published in a journal uh, just the beginning of this year. It's the early stages of the work, so I welcome the conversation of afterwards. I hope very much that we'll have that moment to have the conversation. By the way, to the timekeepers, I started, we start, it started late, so please keep that in mind. The analysis developed 
in this presentation draws on principles derived from psychoanalysis in that the paper is concerned with exploring the intersection between these, those aspects of the self that are unarticulated or even inarticulable and the conscious experiences that are part of the everyday relational encounters in the social environment. I should emphasize at the outset that the psychoanalytic perspective I take is an applied approach, one that excuses the ahistorical lens of traditional psychoanalysis, which brackets off the social and the political in favor of the exclusively internal or narrowly construed relational that focuses only on the patient analyst relational dynamics. The approach adopted in this analysis joins an emerging, though along in the making, commitment by female scholars across disciplines, including Toni Morrison, Judith Butler, Jessica Benjamin, Jacqueline Rose, Nancy Chodoro, and a few good men, among whom are Franz Fanon, Stephen Frosch, Fred Alford, and other more famous ones. To disrupt the restrictive psychological boundaries of psychoanalysis in the pursuit of progressive social causes. The motivation behind this paper was the feeling that although theories of transgenerational trauma and some of the memory studies theories that offer explanation for the continuities of traumatic pasts have generated many important insights. Some of these pioneering views become theoretical abstractions when applied to historical contexts where traumatic oppression and subjugation have gone on for several generations. For example, Marin Hirsch's concept of post-memory describes how the descendants of Holocaust survivors inherit the memory of their parents' traumatic experiences through mediated encounters with such objects as photographs, stories, and other kinds of artifacts. Alison Landsberg, in her theory of prosthetic memory, also analyzes transgenerational impact traumatic past. According to Landsberg, if affective and cognitive responses evoked by, quote, technologies of mass culture, such as films, museum spaces, and television series that depict historical catastrophes provide a vehicle that connects generations that come after to the events depicted in these forms of cultural expression. This, in my view, has unintended political implications for implicit in the memory metaphor of prosthetic objects, a violent appropriation of something that belongs to disability and trivializes, in other words, it appropriates something that belongs to the world of disability and it trivializes traumatic continuities as a mere removable appendage. Thus, the theory suggests appropriation rather than the direct experience of the recurrence of patterns of human rights violations. And, and these theories scarcely, scarcely ever consider the lived continuities and experiences of historical pasts. For the purposes of this project, I am interested in the psychoanalytically derived concept of transgenerational transmission and to build on it a concept that I believe offers a more productive approach to transgenerational trauma in South Africa and is better suited for application to historical legacies of other similar contexts. For the sake of brevity, I will only highlight 
key points of this theory. The traumas of oppression and subjugation experienced over several generations are collective and multi-generational, resulting in psychic wounding that each descendant generation carries, passing it on to the next generation and to the next. This is accompanied by a sense of quote-unquote entrapment with contemporary subjects being, quote, caught up in a sort of a time warp involving past traumatic events, unquote, as Vamik Vulcan and his colleagues have characterized this transgenerational process. In this view, then, subsequent generations are seen as being at the mercy of an invisible force from the past. Thus, as carriers of their parents' past, the descendants' generation cope, quote, must cope with the unmastered psychological task given to them by their ancestors, unquote. That's Vamik. Now, all this comes from Sigmund, Fro Sigmund Freud's uh, uh, insights that consider these histories, these violent histories of intense traumas as tasks that actually remain unmastered, unfulfilled, unattended in terms of psychological response to them. As a result, they remain a task that must still be continued and completed by subsequent generation. I think it's a very interesting uh, concept, this idea that these transgenerational effects are really about a task that is given, passed on to the next generation to complete the aspects of the traumas that were incomplete. Some scholars refer to this as shadows of the past, the, that the young people, the descendants are inheriting shadows from the past, as Eva Hoffman characterized it, something that is both very alien and deeply familiar, something that only the unconscious knows. Actually, as it turns out, the unconscious also doesn't even know. And this is an insight from Nicholas Abrahams and Marie uh, Turok, who argue that although at the start of the uh, intrusion of these, or of the experience of these uh, past, there is a sense in which they are revealed and known but because they carry an element of secrecy, something that is difficult to articulate, something that is difficult to speak about because it's shaming, it's a, it, 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 it evokes all these emotions that are negative, that diminishes one's identity, they are pushed back into the unconscious. And so these scholars, uh, Nicholas Abrahams and Mary Turok, speak about these traumas as being stacked in a kind of a crypt. They are sort of like in a tomb-like situation in the unconscious, deep in the unconscious, with the word deep very critical here, to the extent that they refer to them as phantoms. These are phantoms that are passed on unknowingly by the parents and they are absorbed by the next generation also unknowingly. It's interesting too that the debates around the notion of the haunting of the past actually began with Abraham Turok, Turok and Mary, uh, and, and Abraham, uh, Nicholas Abraham and Mary Turok. The, the, the word itself, the notion, the concept of the haunting nature of this past began with them and taken up by other scholars like Derrida, uh, like uh, uh, um, uh, Gordon, Avery Gordon, and many others who have taken on this notion of the haunting. I will not go into that except to say that the perspectives portrayed in this scholarly work, this too says very little about the play of the contemporary, the social experiences of the current generation. It's a harking back to the past as if it's only the past that matters, but what I'm interested in is this interplay between the past and the contemporary experiences of trauma. I want, therefore, to introduce what I call a triadic 
theory of traumatic time. That is, an understanding of the traumatic ruptures and transgenerational legacies that can be viewed in three temporal movements. The first layer of time is the past that intrudes into the present in a traumatic formation that is the common knowledge or the common understanding of the trauma. So traumas from the past, including in the present. So this kind of one directional, only to the, from the past to the present and from the present, from the past to the present. This is a unidirectional perspective of this notion. So this is sort of a basic understanding of transgenerational trauma in, that is in terms of the first layer of the temporality that I'm talking about here. The second uh, concept of time, second layer of temporality here, is one that intrudes into the present in a traumatic, uh, in, in a traumatic response that did not exist as a trauma or was not experienced as a trauma in the first instance but it's only in the current time that is reflected upon as if it is a trauma. I'll go into detail about this in a moment. The third temporality of trauma I describe in this uh, concept uh, is, a, is a predictive temporality of trauma in which the present is an anticipatory staging of traumas to occur in the future. And I have to say that this is really the insight, this is the most powerful, in my view, insight that I am introducing in this work. For the sake of time, I will just really glance over the first temporality because it's what psychology describes as the intrusion into the present. And what is important about this particular temporality is that the remembrance of the past and the affective response linked to it mutually constitute one another in the recall of the traumatic past. What this means is that when the trauma is remembered, when the trauma invades the person's consciousness, the emotion that is felt at the time is very comparable to the emotion that was felt then. And you'll see in a moment why this is important to underline. In other words, there's a certain kind of link, direct link in between the experience then and the experience now. The second temporality, however, what is recalled about the past was not present in the conscious realm and only emerges in awareness retrospectively. It is a manifestation of the past that is felt and brought to awareness by events in the present. The force of the moment may emerge from external triggers, including the physical environment, institutional cultures, experience of racism, or symbols that celebrate an oppressive past. In this moment, of reawakening of consciousness, the past and present exchange places and an earlier experience becomes inscribed with traumatic meaning. A term that best captures the phenomenon of the retrospective reconstruction of the meaning of an incident from the past is the Freudian concept, Nachtraglerheit. This was coined by Sigmund Freud to suggest an inherent, quote unquote, forgetting of an experience that is recognized only later. In other words, the recognition of it as a trauma comes only later. As Freud explains, it is a case of a present encounter triggering a memory that is evoked and made possible by a quote unquote, different understanding of this past. By inscribing itself into the present, the memory is dynamically interwoven with other past and present experiences. It is thus reconstituted with such an emotional force that it transforms the past into an overwhelming experience with its helpless and disempowering impact. 
a striking example of this kind of temporality is from black students facing institutional culture and racism at previously white universities in South Africa. So this will serve as really my main example here. Some black students have described in the course of our conversations with students, they've described both here, by the way, and in, at UCT and all the universities. I'm a veteran of these universities, but this is consistent in all, at all these universities, UCT's three states and here. Black students have described how their proximity to the privilege of their white peers heightened their awareness of the deep inequality between them and their white peers, and how even the physical environment, the buildings and the surrounding streets awaken a consciousness about the cruelty of apartheid's inequality with a force of emotions that becomes imbued with traumatic meaning. Some of these students attended previously white schools that were known as Model C schools after the end of apartheid legislation. There, they formed close relationships with white children and even visited their homes for sleepovers. Now, however, reconstructing the traces of these memories and forced to confront the one-sidedness of these relationships for the white children never came to visit their homes in the black residential areas. These memories stir up emotions that are assigned meanings that retrospectively evoke a shameful past that could not be faced at the time and was instead silenced. One of the students participating in a research initiative that I led at, at Free State University, expressed it thus, quote, I can't believe I've been friends with these people, referring to her white peers, for 18 years, she said in a, te in a tearful rage. 18 years, how could I have been blind to that humiliation? The niceness of the parents to keep the facts of the cruelty of this past of apartheid out of view and to keep us all in this position of inferiority. All these black kids going for sleepovers at white homes, never the other way around, unquote. It was said with such a heavy emotion in tearfulness throughout this statement. And that actually is interesting. We may not have time to go into what are the tears about. We often talk about white tears as meaning something, but never actually about other meanings associated with black tears. And I think these kinds of conversations challenge us to confront the issues that lie beneath some of these uh, kinds of expressions. And I'm not implying that the tears are false, but I'm merely saying that it's important that you interrogate in order for us to transcend these experiences and understand what's going on and find ways of repairing them. Understanding at a deeper level is important. This is the purpose of this presentation. For the black students, therefore, as young teenagers at the time of the school, the experience of their assimilation into the dominant cultural world as trauma the impression of it being a trauma had to be suspended psychically, lest it awakened the sleeping dogs of shame. The shame of being considered an other who, according to the rules of the racial pecking order, is inferior. There is something overwhelming about the underlying feeling of shame in this experience of being in two worlds at the same time, denying the feeling of dissonance in oneself to maintain a state of two-ness, of one's subjectivity. It is experienced as something akin to the painful sense of bewilderment and the wrenching of the soul that uh, Du Bois wrote about in his book, Souls of Black Folk, to describe the painful ambiguities of what he termed 
double consciousness. The words of a student activist who was involved in the 2015-2016 National Student Pro Protest at the University of Cape Town will suffice to add another layer of explanation to Du Bois's analysis of the consequences of this assimilation into a white world, and I quote, I had assimilated to whiteness all my life as a means of surviving white capitalist heteropatriarchy. But in 2015, I learned that my assimilation would not save me. I was still black and woman and forgotten and erased. So my rage grew and grew and grew. This is from a recent book written by Pile and Colomba reflecting on the 2015, uh, 2016 students' um, uh, uh, uprising. What is suggested in this quote is that it is as if the person is discovering or has gained a new knowledge concerning their relationship to whiteness. As Du Bois suggests, this unleashes a sense of rage. The rage that is unleashed, I argue, is a renunciation of the sense of humiliation evoked by the confrontation with a memory of what was denied at the time. It is also possible that the emergence of this new consciousness about the past provokes anxieties and confusion. And the rage then functions both as a defense against these overwhelming feelings and an attempt to work through this complicated past. This unsettling temporality of an experience from an earlier political time viewed from a different perspective in the present must be seen as a condition that plagues the born free generation. For the opportunity to partake of the white world has not bestowed the feeling of freedom that it seems to promise at an earlier stage of their schooling. This temporal duality of movement that projects meaning at once from the present to the past and from the past to the present illuminates for me the relevance of both Du Bois's double consciousness and Freud's Nachtraglerheit as concepts that clarify an aspect of the structure of the second temporality in the tri-telescopic framework that I'm proposing here. But I want to draw attention to another dynamic, or rather use another lens that is also pivotal in identifying what is going on here. And for this, I go to Franz Fanon. Fanon's psychoanalytic analysis of his observation of what he terms psychic alienation of the colonized subjects is very informative when you come to think about this idea of assimilation and how the assimilation is not confronted at the time it actually happens until other conditions allow it to emerge. The negative self-perceptions occasioned by the phenomenon of, the, of this experience that uh, of, um, uh, du Bois call, refers to as the double consciousness, or sometimes he uses the term veil as we are approaching black people who are assimilating or who are walking about uh, uh, internalizing whiteness and projecting an image that carries both the blackness and the, and the whiteness at the same time, that this leads these negative perceptions of self one reflects on them lead blacks to question not only their identity and humanity, but also leads to problems of black self uh, diminution. In other words, one, one's identity as a human being, when one is confronted with this history, with this reality, they feel a sense of being diminished, a sense of shame. The shame diminishes them. It's an experience of 
extreme dehumanization that brings people to this point. But what is more challenging is that the person themselves was the doer of the deed. The person brought themselves to this point and hence the rage explodes because now the shame is a responsibility that is difficult to accept but the anger and the rage suggest that some, someone else imposed the, uh, uh, this state of trueness. I want to argue that actually it is someone else who imposes the state of trueness because Fanon himself, when he describes psychoanalytically blackness and whiteness in these colonized societies, describes it as a state that is irredeemable. He says that uh, this cannot be removed, you know, these deeply ingrained uh, tendencies or, or rather identities are so deeply ingrained because the white man is sealed in his whiteness, the black man is sealed in his blackness. This suggests that their identities are fixed and cannot be altered. It also suggests that there is a reciprocal mutual exchange in this self and other conversation. And this is the point that requires a bit more elaboration, and I don't have time to do this uh, at, at this lecture. But what is, what is important to note here is that these are relational processes. The encounter with whiteness and whiteness encounter with blackness evokes these tendencies that uh, Fanon refers to as being sealed to whiteness and being sealed to blackness. What does that mean? It means that from the perspective of whiteness, it's the position of superiority, sealed into superiority. From the position of blackness, it's the position of inferiority, sealed in that position. So that in the encounter, in these moments that I referred to, I described, is in the examples that I've just given, what goes on is that it's not just the black person responding or acting in a way that assimilates, but there is something in the encounter with whiteness that is in a way projected onto the black person so that they behave, they internalize what is projected and act as if they are what, they are what is being projected onto them. Hopefully there'll be more time to talk about this at some point, but what I'm trying to convey here is that there is a reciprocal, mutual engagement in this encounter, and it is happening at a very deeply unconscious le level. Now, I worry about these views, uh, the views of people like Du Bois and F Fanon, because they sort of lock us into some truisms that thus says Franz Fanon, and therefore, you know, given that we are at this moment, we can do nothing about it. We are sealed, as he says. Blackness is sealed into, into their blackness, and whiteness is sealed into their whiteness. And yet, we know that living in these societies where we are, where we are living together, where we have to live together, we have to find a way of crossing these boundaries, of rupturing these boundaries that lock us in these kinds of ways of relating to the world. This is a topic that I will discuss at the end of my talk. Now, the final temporality in this tri triguous temporality, in this triguous understanding of time, is based on the idea that time stretches from several generations back and, and to the present. And then there is a sense in which there is a staging in the present, there is a staging of a future time, as if it's a premonitory kind of uh, prophetic uh, um, uh, understanding of what is going to happen in the future, or what is going to unfold in the future. And I return to describe this, uh, this temporality, I return to the hearings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I do this because the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 
was a moment where we were carving and imagining a future time. South Africa was gathering uh, together to imagine a future time that is different from the past. We are at that future time now that was imagined by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and it ain't what it was supposed to be. And so I returned to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to ask the question, what did we miss at the time of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? There are several things I can say about this, but I want to focus on one. And that one is the voice of Nomonde Kalata, who at the first hearing of the Truth, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, during her testimony, let out a scream that shattered the hall. It was a large hall. Her scream in the way that she gave her testimony, gave the testimony both in words and also in her body, through her body, speaking her pain into this audience and shattering the ceiling of the hall in an unimaginable way. I consider Nomonde Talata to be an important figure of our political time because she allows us to think in this particular way. Her scream for this purpose of returning to the TRC and for framing this conceptual understanding of transgenerational trauma, her scream was a staging of the future. Her scream was carrying the weight of many women's screams and cries and unfinished business of pain they've suffered for generations in the past. We could name several incidents that she, as a woman, as a mother, as the body of a woman, carrying this pain and screaming it into this moment, this particular historical moment that was a moment of hope and how now looking back, that scream tells us that there was something else going on and that something else was that this is screaming into the future. This pain is not just a pain screaming from the past that I carry within on, in my body, but it's a pain that is screamed into the violence that is going to unfold in the future. The cry is then a foreshadowing of an impending doom of violence to come, representing the collective lament of communities of survivors, crying out for the unmourned remains of loved ones, many of which are still hidden in the secret graves that uh, cover our land. As an interruption, the cry signaled a staging of a future in which the chaos of violence doesn't cease, pointing not to closure and healing, but rather pointing at a question screamed into the future. When will it end? The TRC, it was hoped, would put the past behind and be in the past, and the present would be a stepping stone toward reaching the horizon of a future of new imaginaries. But this hope for temporal structure has failed the born free generation and has failed us as the generation of people who were brought to grow up under apartheid. We have seen, we have witnessed in South Africa the violence and the scream of Normandy's generation re-emerging in the present. The miners shot down, the labor strikes, life is a demeni, Andres Tatane, all illustrative of this state in which the past is not past, but rather a lived continuity. The gloomy and tragic reality of this cycle of repetition of the past has played out in South African society and in our institutions. As a concept, what I'm proposing today, this triadic perspective of transgenerational traumatic memory captures the predictive temporality, but also names the deed. It's not just a haunting that exists in crypts and phantoms, 
it's something we know, we can see what is going on. And this allows us then to think about how do we address these problems. Now I mentioned earlier that my earlier work was work that was focusing as this, as the truth, that what we need is really these journeys of forgiveness and reconciliation. We still need these journeys. But more than that, what we need is citizenship and civil solidarity. Citizenship, dignity, and solidarity. And in order to do that, we need to start by naming what is going on. By naming what is going on, by exposing our vulnerability, creating these spaces of trust where we can engage in these pursuits of what is going on, as I have tried to elaborate in this, uh, in this paper. How do cultures grapple with these collective memories that are so complicated, these collective memories of past? I believe it can be argued that the reparative quest is under threat of being doomed precisely because of the anxiety that forecloses any possibility of connection. This convergence of anxiety-provoking factors inhibits not only the possibility of meaningful reflection, but also of constructive interaction with people, between people who have suffered and those who have been privileged. I return to these images from Mark Stone's, uh, uh, especially this one, and, and this I will end it here, to convey the message that one of the important things that we require, we need in our society, starting with our institutions, is first of all to face these kinds of past, to face what's going on head on. But beyond facing, we need models of dealing with questions of restitution. I'm very pleased that one of my colleagues, Valen Fervut, is here today because he's one person who is unpacking our institution's restitution statement so that it puts real material value to it. I can tell you now, in, I have in my work on apology, forgiveness, reconciliation, I have never encountered such a profound statement of restitution. But Velen challenges us. He asks, what does it mean? How do we put flesh into the statement? And one of the things that has emerged in the work that he's doing is a return to the museum as a space for engaging with these histories in a way that could create space for connection, for empathy. And so, this is what Mark Soms did. Forget for a moment where the project stands now, but what he did is that he did an actual excavation. You know, we speak about the excavation of history in terms of narratives. Mark Soms actually excavated the land that he, had, he, he, that he was owning, he owned, Delta Soms Delta. And in the excavation, these were the objects that were found, objects that belong to the original inhabitants of the land and the Dutch who came in the 16th century. And here is a fantastic story. We don't have time, unfortunately, to go into the details of the reparative humanism, but hopefully during the discussion. But here is one moment that I want to share with you from this. One of the workers whom he had inherited, by the way, because the laws apartheid laws were that workers on farms are owned a property. So he bought the property and he inherited the workers unknowingly and he had to do something about it. So when they were excavating the land and they found actually these artifacts, one of the men who had been, who was a child there, had grown, grown up there, was a worker and was a child of parents who worked on the farm and his grandparents had worked on the farm and now he was encountering this process of excavation. He runs to Mark Songs 
Mark is working with an archaeologist at UCT, and so she interprets what's going on. He's very excited. He runs carrying one of the artifacts. He says, Professor, Professor, Professor. And Mark Stones is like very excited running through the passages of the house. Professor, my people were here before your people. And Mark's journey from that point onwards was to answer the question, what do I do about that? He tried, and that trying is something that confronts us all, that given this kind of history, given the depth of all these dynamics, our trying has to recognize that this is not a superficial thing that you wave with your hand and say it's in the past. The consequences are deep on both sides. And so the trying is important. The fact that it's going to be difficult, and it is, some scholars actually have dismissed trying and said nothing will ever change. They may well be right. However, the fact that we know that nothing will ever change means that every time we get up, we must make an effort to try to make it change. It is possible to do a new thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Pumlago Bodo Madikizela, for the presentation on the afterlife of violent histories, a, a triadic temporality of memory and the repair of humanism. I think you've taken us through the journey. You've taken us through the importance of looking at this triadic depiction of trauma um, based on three time spans which you gave us. And um, I think what I'll do now is to just have some time for us to engage and to ask our colleagues who are here to also engage. So I just want to check with Jonathan. If I sit there, will I be heard online or do I have to stand here? So I can sit there. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so I'll just take a seat now. So, yeah, thank you so much again, once again, uh, and uh, it's really special. I know when we asked uh, Prof to give um, her talk, she said, you know, I've done this before. I was promoted several, uh, several years ago, so I think it was good that we had to hear again because this is a very special moment for us. So in the presentation, um, and if you can just prepare questions from your side, because I'd like us to have uh, some dialogue or discussion on this. Um, I, I just want to ask maybe from my side to start off with, um, you know, what you talk about, the importance of um, the fact that you say that we can't just say, you know, forget the past and then move into the future. So um, if you look at the work you did through the Truth Reconciliation Commission, for example, and where we are today, um, at the time when you were doing that, do you have any regrets? Do you think that there's something that could have been done to change our present uh, from the past when we went through these uh, Truth Reconciliation Commissions? Yeah, okay. should you help us? Yeah. I have no regrets. In fact, I suspended my PhD research at the time to go to the Truth Commission because I believed in the process. I believed uh, that we were coming full circle uh, as a child under apartheid, an adult under apartheid, a professional under apartheid. It was such a, a beautiful moment. It really was. Um, so no regrets. However, I think that um, there are certain things that perhaps we could have done at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, one of which is, is just, just an, an, a, a way of trying, 
of trying to bring the conversations at the public level. It ended up being a, um, an individual to individual kind of encounter. It was not, it was supposed to be national, which it was national process, but the actual process ended up being like encounters between victims and perpetrators. You know, that being said, there, there is no other way that could have been done within the TRC itself. But I think there could have been another process that brings it out into the open. We could have tried harder. I have to say that we did, to a certain extent, um, in my role as the chair of the public hearings, one of the conversations I initiated was public dialogues on reconciliation. Unfortunately, only one happened. And that one uh, event uh, was supposed to, to get the public to participate in the process. And as it turns out, it's one of the most cited examples of conversation about reconciliation globally, what happened in that, in that room. We could, have, we could have done more of those, not just in Cape Town, not just one. That's the one thing that really could have happened. The other things that have happened really have to do with the politics of where we are today. Really less to do with the Truth Commission and more to do with how politicians have handled our moment of transition, how they have taken it forward and really, really destroyed the hopeful moment that we're all looking forward to. That is where I would lay the blame of where we are today, not at the TRC. Um, the greatest responsibility, in fact, if there were to be a an international criminal court. The greatest responsibility, there is a term in these processes where the international criminal court asks those with the greatest responsibility. You know, they are underlings, the greatest. If we were to have an international criminal court reflecting on where we are, what's going on now, the politicians would be the ones charged with the crimes of just laying the country to waste in the way that they've done. No question about that. Sure. So that really is where the blame should be. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, is there, are there any questions from the floor at the moment? Um, yeah, we have a few questions. So maybe uh, b before, if you can just pass on the mic, but while we are doing that, I just want to maybe a follow up question on that. So, so there are many arguments that um, you know we hear, especially amongst uh, black communities, around you know the, the inequality that exists, and also some of the issues from the past, land issues not being addressed, and so forth. So, I just wanted to know from you, and, and anger, or sometimes which displays in s itself in terms of the violence that we see, and also violence against women as well amongst our communities. So uh, do you see the proposal that you have for us to have, you do talk about us continuing with the spaces where we can have these discussions. Um, but I just want to see from the, you know, the proposal that you have in this new paper that you have on the track, uh, looking at this in terms of uh, you know, the times, the present, past, and future, uh, trying to bring that together. Do you see um, any ways in which these issues can be addressed? I know we talk about them, but how can we actually come to a table where um, you know, we, we can actually resolve the issues we face. I think it also includes, you know, racism, which still exists in some sectors, and also I think for our university, some of the things that we are battling with. Mm -hmm. So if you can comment on that, and then I just want to take the questions from the floor as well after that. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a very important question, and I think my response is equally important, but I'm going to try to make it short just to give a sense of where I'm going with it. One of the things that really troubles me, and um, uh, uh, I suppose troubles me as a person who has, who has witnessed violence. My work was born in violence. I worked uh, with human rights lawyers uh, who were defending young people who had committed necklace murders, and my role was to help the courts to understand uh, uh, why the violence of that kind 
it was the most difficult uh, part of my, my work, but it brought me face to face with violence and the consequences of suffering uh, in, in complicated ways. Um, one, of the, one of the questions I've been turning around in my head has to do with why is it that these experiences are repeated, you know, we are living through a period of repetition. You know, the generation before me, if you speak about the TRC, Archbishop Tutu, and the generation after, they, it's the same issues over and over again. And so I mean, it, it's very difficult to work in terms of large numbers, you know, like the country, the nation. But it's possible at institutions like ours to think about how do we empower young black people who come into the university? How do we empower them in a way that they really reclaim the space as theirs? You know, I mean, there is the history of the feelings of marginalization, feeling excluded, feeling a sense of, I don't belong. You come to university, I don't feel I don't belong. But is there a way, might we be able to imagine ways of empowering Black people, black colored and Indian people. I mean that in a, I know that it's not, sometimes people want to be named uh, in, in terms of their groups, but please forgive me. What I mean is to really have a, a program of mentoring young students. When they, these, these um, orientation programs at the beginning of the year, I think that that could be the beginning of how do we make young black students coming here to own the place so that when they step in here, nobody can tell them that you don't belong. Nobody can, can make them, you can make them feel, but how do, we, how do we empower, how do we mentor in a way that people learn the language of resisting? I resist your telling me that I don't belong here, you know? How do, we, how do we impart that kind of learning? And it's a, it's a, it's a different way, because now what happens is that, you know, one of the, one of the statements, uh, the last one from this, the person from UCT, you know, it's, it's this is saying, I discovered I'm a victim. In fact, actually, there was a film here last year or two years ago that was made by an Austrian woman who, interviewed people who were activists uh, during 2015-2016 and reinforced this idea of people feeling proud that I discovered that I'm a victim. I mean, yes, that's the, it's important to note, but then it, there is another way of empowering people because you are not supposed to be a victim at any campus for that matter. So how do you mentor young students really in a way that is intentional so that they feel they belong here. However, you've got to mentor white students as well. And I was thinking the other day that perhaps the orientation should also involve white parents. You know, white parents brought in to an orientation program so that they kind of also understand, because that's where the problem, some of the problems begin there, because parents are not transformed the kids come here, they're taken through all these processes, and some of them really make an effort and you can see the change, and then they go home and then something happens, and then, you know, they come back, they are, they, they, they are changed. So, okay. anyway, you can see, I told you, <laughs> yes. I said, I don't know how to make this short, so. <laughs> no, that's fine. I just want to take maybe two or three questions from the floor. I have on this side, yes, if you can please um, introduce yourself, your name quickly. And then, yeah, and then if you can t uh, tell us the question. I'll take three questions and then we'll have a response uh, from Prof. Uh, can thank you go ahead, please? Thank you so much and thank you, Prof Kumla, for this incredibly thoughtful and moving okay, lecture. Louder, we can't yeah. seem to hear. Sorry, that. is that better? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for this incredibly thoughtful and um, moving lecture. My name is Karina Fenter uh, from the Department of Music. Um, 
in a sense, you've already started to to address my question in in your in your previous answer, um, and it's it's a difficult question. Um, I came across a piece that was written in the late 1980s called "The Need to Forget." Um, it's written by Yehuda Elkano, who's a, a leftist, a liberal, a Jewish. Israeli commentator, and he's, he asks the question, what are we doing year after year after year when we remind our children to remember, to remember, to remember the Holocaust whilst this devastation of, of Palestine uh, and Israel is happening around us? And and it took me to that poem by Borges, uh, another poem of gifts, where he says, I give thanks for the gift of forgetting. And and I want to I want to ask you, how do we hold on to this triadic structure or temporality of memory, which which I don't think in South Africa is a matter of choice. We see it erupt around us all the time. Um, how do we hold on to that? But then also, what are the, what is the place, if any, in South Africa of, of forgetting um, and not ignoring, right? Um, so so that's, that's one question. Is, is, there, is there a way in which memory traps us? And I'm interested in, in those questions of, of victimhood that you, that you also ask. So what, what does an emancipative memory look like, I guess? Um, and then the second question has to do with the ways in which memory tie in with our socioeconomic devastated present. So if we, if we are able structurally and politically to address uh, the problems facing South Africa, to what, to what degree would that in a sense, shift the conversation in relation to memory. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, there was another hand. I think was it? Yes, okay, I'll go for you. Was there a hand on my left? Yes, so it's two and then three over there. Please speak louder so that there are people online who also will hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Pumla, for your beautiful lecture. Um, you talked about memory narrative and forgiveness. And I liked the aspect where you talked about the woman who gave a scream and said she was carrying the scream of other women. So my question is, how does forgiveness in violent histories create a healing effect in transge transgenerational traumas? How does forgiveness in violent histories create a healing effect in transgenerational traumas? Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Votelo Majola. Um, mine, I don't know if it's a question, uh, but um, I'm not a scholar, so I'm in the corporate. And, and as Prof was presenting, there was a lot um, happening um, in, my, in my mind. And some of the, of the stories you shared I could relate because I was also at UCT at some point. Um, but um, when it comes, the, the question I have, and I understand your question that you, you, you're posing to, to the floor, that um, is there anything that um, we as the, as, as the society can do to actually empower, I mean, you mentioned things like in the orientation space and all of that um, during the, um, the orientation week and all of that. Uh, my, something that is, is in my mind is that um, is, it, is, it, is it possible that those that are causing trauma, whether it's racial or not, or abuse, are, do they really understand that their actions um, translate into trauma to the one who's receiving or to the victim, you know, um, because it, it, it becomes a repetition and a repetition and a repetition. Um, we see a lot of this now in, in corporate. Um, there's even terms that, that are coined where you would have gone through university life, but you go, and maybe you, you, you get to understand that, okay, there's, 
there, there were there were people that were inferior as a bla as a black person, you know, and maybe these things. Once I'm working, it's gonna go away. But when you get to the workplace, it's like it's starting over and over again. Then you get people that are known as blue-eyed balls. It's like it's a coin that is that is a, a term that is coined. It's, it's kind of acceptable, and 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 hence. I, I, my, what comes to mind is, do, they, do people really understand that when you're sitting in an environment, in a workplace, you equally am um, qualified to be in that position, but when you are in the boardroom, it's like you are nothing kind of thing, you know, and some of these are subtle, some of them are quite overt. And the other one, moving away even from the, from the, from the racial divide, but you, you mentioned the, the issues of um, life as a demon and all of that, and what came to mind was the issue of Babita, who, who, who was um, murdered or assassinated, doing the right thing. Do people actually understand what impact or the trauma that has on any person or any female at work or anyone who's actually trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying mine, I don't know if it's a question, maybe. Th thank it's you, a yeah, we'll take that as questions. And then the very last one, uh, just because of time, you'll be able to meet Prof outside to have a discussion, but can I take the last question? Thank you so much. Um, just remember to say your name quickly and briefly, the question, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hetman Tlapo. I'm a PhD candidate in the Practical Theology and Missiology Department in the faculty. This is theology faculty, right? Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, we had a conversation yesterday with regards to, to this, and I have a, an academic specific interest into, into this. You are saying that we should look into the models of restitution. Right? Who is responsible for restitution now? Because personal restitution, let's forget about that. Because I think the TRC to a certain extent failed. But who is responsible for restitution in the post TRC South Africa? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll allow you to respond to these mm -hmm. questions. Thank you. Um, I, I, will, I will attempt to respond to your question about restitution. I, I think it's important that um, it's important to think about these processes as multifaceted and that not one approach will resolve whatever issues uh, we are facing, that if restitution is seen as a multifaceted process and then we attempt to address, you know, uh, some of the, the strategies as best as we can. The importance, I think, is that it becomes a collective commitment and that's why I, I mentioned the idea of the museum that my colleague Valen Felvut and other colleagues in the room from AVREC have been involved in driving because it's not, it's not gonna, it's, it's not a compensatory, one I don't think shouldn't look at it in, as a compensatory kind of function in the sense of you are, you, you know, there's some, something, uh, uh, it's a compensation. It's more a question, and this is what I'm interested in, and not to say that the other questions about compensation are not important, but what I think is possible to be done collectively are processes that involve, that are invitational and invite others to participate in them, so that the idea is about how do we build how do you make this a place for all? How do we make, how do we remember the past in a way that is about ensuring that we don't do this again? This is why the Holocaust uh, uh, framework of Thou Shalt Remember, you know, as in just remember, I find it's unsuited for us because it's a remembering that actually 
rekindles hatreds. It's not a remembering that is designed to drive a process of repair. And what I know that you say that TRC was useless, but what it introduced into our conversations was really the possibility that we can have a process of engaging collectively, collaborating in engagement. Um, the idea of forgetting is that is you, you can't, it's out of the question. There's a lot of scholarship and there are a lot of philosophical views also from uh, ancient philosophers who drive the idea of the importance of forgetting. But it's unrealistic. We, we have found in our work that you, if you try to push things, this is what I'm trying to say in this work, you try to push things into a world of forgetfulness, it will out in whatever way, it will out. So how do you create spaces that you remember for a purpose of rebuilding? Because if you don't acknowledge people's pains, I mean, in the US today, you know, slavery more than two centuries ago, you know, but African Americans still feel that no one acknowledged, you know, the crime of slavery in the US. That is, is, should tell us something. Um, so we can't, in, in fact, now there is a, a growing scholarship globally on remembrance because countries have realized, countries and institutions in those countries have realized that you cannot go on pretending that things did not happen. Just the other day, the Guardian newspapers had a major article recognizing how the Guardian newspaper benefited from slavery. And they are giving out millions of pounds towards restitution. How does restitution happen? By training, they are going to train journalists, they are going to make an effort to go to communities, train journalists, track those communities of people, of enslaved people, or descendants of enslaved people who benefited, who were the ones who lost, were, on, on whose backs they built the Guardian newspaper. It's a big thing. I was at Harvard University to last year in April. They were launching their report, a big report on their investigation into the role of Harvard in slavery, how the university, Harvard University, enriched itself through the sale of slaves. They traced, they, they hired historians who tracked the histories of the people in their archives, tracked them down to the area where they were sold found, identified, positively identified descendants of the slave, slaves that Harvard had sold. So all these institutions, Europe, the Dutch, every, all these countries now are reconnecting with the idea of how do you repair the past? It's everywhere. It cannot be denied. What is, what is frustrating about South Africa is that white South Africans really finding it, it's almost like it's a right to deny the privilege of the past. And that is where things get stuck, stuck in our country, because there's this sense in which you dare not talk about the past because, you know, some white South Africans feel that you are you're harping on a history that should be forgotten. And it's very similar to what happened in Germany just after the war where Germans were in full denial. No one was talking about the Nazi, Nazi Holocaust. On the contrary, they did not know. Even people who were in the neighborhood of these concentration camps, they did not know. Only in the 1960s with the younger generation that started to ask questions and the films about the Holocaust, almost like raising up a mirror and saying, this is who you were. This is your history. So that denial, is, is something that we have seen before. It's not new, you know, the fact that there's a, a, a challenges about what is happening at our university, even now, it's also a symptom of the big denial. Part of the denial, and again, it's important for us to perhaps understand part of the denial is because it's difficult for people to face, because once you face it and admit that you were involved, you benefited, you supported, then you are alarmed in the views of many people. You are alarmed together with people like Eugene Ducock. 
And yet, that is the reality. You know, this is why I think that uh, to answer your question, uh, you, you, you can't, forgetting is not an option for us, for these countries with these long histories uh, of oppression. Instead, what is needed is to find creating ways of reconnecting with others, building these sites of, you know, uh, honoring human dignity, creating spaces of empowering people so that they feel they belong. It shouldn't be the case in South Africa that today, 30 years after 94, there are still black people who feel they don't belong to Stellenbosch or to UCT or to, or to any of these universities. It shouldn't be. It challenges us, therefore, to rethink the strategies that we have used and to really think about how do we create spaces, how do we have people who are in the leadership, in, 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 you know, in student leaders who are the mature ones, how do they, we work with them so that the space is a space for all. When students come here, they don't feel like, oh, you know, I'm going to be feeling isolated. They must feel this is theirs, this belongs to them. No one has a right to make you feel you don't belong. Thank you so much. I, I think, well, so I know we had other questions, so I, I hope you, um, you know, for the colleagues who didn't get a chance to ask, you may, you may have a chance to chat to Professor Pumla after this um, session. I want to bring this to the close as well, but also thank you really for, you know, at least giving us a time to engage with you on the questions as well. And to really um, say that, so uh, the message in, uh, which you are giving us is that um, uh, maybe forget forgetfulness is no longer a virtue. I know I read this somewhere where it said forgetfulness is a virtue if what you are forgetting is that someone hit you. But I guess, um, you know, we have uh, part of the, what you're telling us is that we need to create spaces um, where we can um, allow people to remember but also to connect, to reconnect. Um, a lot of um, you know reference which has been given given good examples what happens in the schools um, and I think for Stellenbosch I see the choir for example if you look at the choir the composition of the choir and not just in terms of statistics but how you can have spaces in which you can bring people together to reconnect uh, to understand what's going on and to to to, to break um, these um, you know the isolation. Um, but then also we still have a lot to do. I think for those of you who are in the crowd who still have the gift of life, and the gift of life I look at as the, the people are younger than 50, I suppose, or is it younger than 55? Uh, there's a lot to do. Uh, so you can't keep on blaming the, you know, what happened in the Truth Reconciliation Commission we haven't achieved, but there's a lot of work to do. And I like the example you give about the corporate world also what happens at the you know, boardrooms and so forth, and you know, the isolation that people may feel, that we all have a role to play, and each one of us must make sure that in the circles of influence we have, that we can you know, begin to be influencers and bring the change that we want to see in our spaces. So I want to say thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Uh, before you stand up, uh, I just have to give uh, the certificate to Professor. It's another certificate for giving the talk. And then if you can clap when we do that, because she, she, she will have this on her record and she'll remember us many years from now and maybe be able to look back to how the changes take place. But thank you so much for sharing again and uh, congratulations again on the latest paper. And we look forward to your next book. You didn't tell us what's your next book on. It's on this topic. Uh, what is you, the title you've just, of the book? You've just given me leave. The topic. You've forgotten. Yeah, so, but what is it going to be called? There you go. Here's a mic. <laughs> That's a very unfair question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yeah. so, we can stand and then I just give um, a prof this to say thank you so much and it was really interesting here.
Yes, I am so sorry. I Thank you so much for all that you have. So just give us a few minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you.